let's uh, now look at uh, what we think the estimated cost productions were for this 2020 harvest. Um, uh, and then we'll lead on to sort of looking at uh, forward planning and, and how that might feed into that um, process. So this is this is looking at um, these crops uh, and uh, we've put them on a pound per hectare basis just to start with. We'll, we'll look at the pound per ton figures um, shortly. So if we, if we go back to those key input price trends um, that we saw earlier, we generally saw uh, a decline in those those prices um, during the season. And uh, it was all really sort of fungicides that sort of um, showed any any real increase. Um, so what we've done here is taken for 2018, 2019, the, the average results from our farm bench figures um, to visit across across the UK, average across the UK, um, they're just conventional crops. Um, so there's no organics uh, in here. Um, and um, then what we've tried to do is estimate what we think this 2020 harvest figure would look like. And we've taken the, the, the trends in those input prices and applied them to uh, the figures in 2019 to try and get an estimate for this this year uh, for these per hectare um, figures. So what we've seen here, you can see uh, the, the the actual cost production on a per hectare basis for all these three crops has, has actually come down uh, from that. Um, from your guys point of view, does does that make sense? Is that what you would probably expect on a per hectare basis? It's so, uh, an interesting one. Um, I suppose, I, I don't know, I mean, different uh, different parts of the country, um, depending on what you, you've seen, you know, yield being the biggest influencer. Um, and we've all had very different harvests over, over the last uh, three years there, um, which, you know, we have seen the extremes. Um, David, what would be your comments? Or I, um, I think it's... Well, sorry. Yeah, sorry, Chris. Uh, um, my uh, sort of thinking of looking at that is that the figures that are there are very consistent year on year for all of the crop, all three crops. Um, there's really not much to choose between them at any uh, anywhere, anywhere there, um, which, given the differences in seasons, slightly uh, means that people aren't actually paying attention to the difference in seasons and they're just putting uh, the same thing on every time. Uh, I mean, I may be maybe misinterpreting that, but that's that's the sort of if you look at the mm. the cost of production on a per hectare basis, it's there's nothing to choose between the three years for any of those three crops. No, the declines for this 2020 harvest is already three to four percent down on what what we expected in 20 what we saw in 2019. So mm. uh, you're right, David. I mean, yeah, very little difference, which uh, again was was interesting to see. I just wonder in the background, is there differences? on certain areas. So one area is higher in one year than it is another, but it's made up by a, a, a saving somewhere else. So although the averages are very similar, one year fertilizer mm. might have dropped, but you might have actually ended up using more labor fuel. You know, uh, fuel yeah. price might have gone up, but fertilizer might have, you know what I mean? Although it's come out as an average, there, there will be a story behind each of those numbers. Mm. And as Chris said, ultimately, yield is a big factor in that. Mm -hmm. Well, we've mentioned yield. So let's have a look at these figures then on a on a per ton basis uh, and see what they're showing us. So um, starting with the the wheat, then um, we've we've seen a sort of significant increase in the estimated wheat cost production for 2020 based on reports of the national wheat yield being down around about sort of 18 uh, percent with the the latest figures that we've we had. Um, so that when you factor that in actually pushes up that uh, winter wheat cost production per ton um, quite significantly over 20 pounds per ton. When we look at the the spring wheat, uh, not a huge change. We've seen uh, again reports coming out of spring barley um, yields down about sort of six percent. Um, we, we've, we've seen huge variation across the country uh, but on average um, down about six percent and so the increase on a per ton basis is, is much smaller than what we've seen with wheat. Um, oilseed rape is, is where we've seen a bigger yield drop in, in some areas than others, um, but generally um, the average there is about 11% down on, on the latest reports. So cost per ton figures up there, yeah, nearly, nearly sort of £30 a ton. So again, quite a significant uh, increase. 
What's, what are people's thoughts uh, around that then? It's uh, scary to see it in figures, isn't it? I mean, that's, uh, yeah, cost of production before any profit, obviously. Um, it's, uh, it is quite a swing, isn't it? 156 pounds a tonne. That puts a lot of pressure on the market and strategy. Uh, I think we're quite lucky that the wheat price is, is where it is just now uh, for 2020. Uh, you know, it's going to depend on how much was forward sold in the year. Mm -hmm. Whether you can achieve that or make profit on it. Um, I think it also, I think it also, Chris does highlight. I mean, I think Mark mentioned that you know, 2020 low yield, low 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 numbers, and if you were fortunate to have good numbers or good a better yield, you will be better than that. But you know that that that's 156 is still a a decent average if you're going to be selling to mm -hmm. get to that 156. Well, exactly. And, you know, when you pick out the trend settling the wheat there, you know, 30 pounds a hectare is 10 pound a tonne um, mm -hmm. would be what you see there. So, you know, making a saving on, on 30 pounds a hectare on inputs, uh, you know, as long as it doesn't affect yield, is probably worthwhile. And the um, other argument is, you know, maybe you should concentrate more on marketing as well. <laughs> yeah. you Absolutely. Know, you know, it's not just about the savings to be made, it's the cost to be, to be gotten. Mm -hmm. And if there's a, and if you know your cost of production, okay, it might be one five six, but if you can sell it for one five seven, well, you're automatically going to be you're straight mm -hmm. away on the plus side. Absolutely, mm -hmm. you know, you think well, you know, one eight two today is fine, but uh, you, you know, twenty twenty one price is what one five two or one five three, I think. Mm -hmm. There's a bit of uh, work. And how many people have managed to sell spring barley at one five six this year? Well, to, to average one five six, mm. would I be can difficult. almost guarantee one five six will be impossible. Yeah, mm. unless you're some sort of miracle worker. Mm. Um, I mean, don't Same get me wrong. The right, but three seven two. Yeah, wow. I, I think the spring barley one's a bit of a difficult one. I mean, it's a national average, so again, mm. it'll be it would be from a Scottish point of view, it'd be interesting to see actually what the yields were like in Scotland because I suspect that we may be slightly better than that. Um, this is that's just going from my my own opinion. Um, mm -hmm. I, I mean, it, that's just what it is. It 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 gets interesting because it, you know we're talking about harvest movement. You know, barley is generally moved off farm at harvest um, and moved on. But we do hear about um, you know friends in the states that the cost of production um, and and the price um, for maize at the minute they're actually better storing it than they are selling at the minute so quite a few people are, are holding back on the market um mm. because it's not it's not worth selling and just uh, doing enough to keep the cash flow ticking over uh, I, I mean are we getting to that stage with with spring barley um you know actually you're just about better to sit on it than to sell it perhaps it's difficult you need to you need to really split feed and malting unfortunately i think yeah. in this scenario mm -hmm. um i can maybe see the argument with feed grains um and there's a whole complex argument around malting, um, <laughs> you know, to do with quality control and uh, who's responsible if it doesn't make the grade once it comes out of mm -hmm. store, whose barley is it? Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I don't disagree, Chris, um, yeah. but it's maybe easier in a feed scenario. Mm. Yeah, uh, and that, uh, I think, you know, when we look at the oilseed rape, I mean, that's um, that that's concerning. Um, to see the, the the cost of production at three hundred and seventy two pounds a ton, um, it's, you know it's quite a, quite an increase uh, in three years. Which, uh, but I think that's down to yield predominantly in twenty twenty mm. because look at the cost of production. The actual pounds per hectare is actually less than year before. Mm. Mm. So we're maybe masking. At, you know, you're looking at a bad oilseed rape year, or is it maybe a normal oilseed rape year? I don't know. Um, it, it's definitely. Question mark, question mark, I suppose, that round it's fine mm. up here, but I know there's other parts of the country don't struggle with it. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. I think there's definitely been a, a very, uh, a very variable uh, result uh, for oil seed rate this year uh, around the country. So I think certainly if, you, if you've been fortunate to have good yields this year uh, with those lowest cost of production, then um, you, you'll certainly be a, a happier person than um, mm. those in the other parts of the country where they've been hit by <laughs> cabbage flea. Uh, beetle and uh, uh, whatever else um, to uh, reduce their yields significantly. So, 
It's, uh, but that, yeah. That's one of the challenges with oilseed rape, of course, because those costs are front loaded. And so you're going to be facing higher costs before you know you've got a good crop. So there's less scope to be able to save money later in the year with a, you know, a lower input system. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Absolutely. OK, um, just going to summarise then um, what those those figures that we've just gone through show. Um, so for the 2019 20 year, we, we saw that the, the input prices generally were lower, which contributed to uh, probably lower costs on a per hectare basis. Um, but on a on a sort of per ton basis, because of the, the generally lower yields that we've seen um, across the country, um, those those costs are, are likely to be higher uh, for this 2020 year. But uh, looking forward to 2021, those input prices, we, we're seeing some increases uh, and reports of increases, certainly around seeds and, and fuel, uh, which is, is probably not surprising. So um, possibility of the, uh, you know, the harvest 2021 cost of production figures maybe being, being a bit higher on a, on a per hectare basis uh, than what we've seen, seen this year. What they'll do on a per ton basis, who knows? Um, you know, I wouldn't want to forecast what yields might be in 2021. Um, it's, more, it's difficult enough uh, trying to sort of forecast uh, some of these input prices, but uh, uh, certainly uh, it's looking like at the moment, if the input price is uh, increasing like we are, that we, we may well see in 2021 higher cost of production. Absolutely. It does certainly focus the mind on to knowing your cost of production and therefore starting to budget and plan uh, and uh, definitely a lot of, of pressure on the, the market and for the year ahead, I would suggest there's there's going to have to be a strategy there. Um, you know, once you figure out <coughs> the cost of production, I, I would suggest. So how important is it then to budget knowing, you know, what what we've just seen in these figures? How important is it then to sort of budget for the year ahead and, and try to do some planning around it? Uh, it'll obviously vary when you start seeing the numbers at the cost of per tonne. You know, if you're seeing wheat at 156 for 2020 and OK, you know that perhaps that was a bad yielding year for you and you maybe you can be a bit more realistic about what 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 yield you might get. And you can start seeing prices, as Chris said, of 150 ish. You know, you need to know those numbers to then maybe start making some selling decisions based around them. Um, yeah. Knowing that everything else is like to creep a little. But um, Definitely. Know, there's, there, there's prices there that probably will make money. Yeah, but you, you've got to know that rather than just to mm. know that's a good price or, you yeah. know, that's OK. And I think, you know, we've been doing that with some of our, our business groups with you guys in them that actually mm. it's one thing with Farmbench looking back on the cost, but actually to get some costs in going forward is actually a, a bit more helpful from the programme um, to try and drive, you know, to see where the efficiencies can be made. I would suggest that, you know, we have to have a, a marketing strategy from there on that heavily revolves around the cost of production. Um, and like you say, a £30 a hectare, um, saving £10 a tonne is probably worth it. Mm. From a practical point of view, how, how do you sort of pull together those budgeting figures? Um, do you just take the previous years and make some judgments around maybe whether some of the changes or, you know, what, what, what practically is the process that, uh, that we'll, go, we'll go through? So when we've done in the past, um, you can pull forward your machinery costs on an assumption basis. Um, and then obviously we put a crop in uh, for, for the next harvest year. And then, you know, you have to have a budget yield in your mind, um, which is you know achievable, shall we say, bearing no natural weather events. Um, and then, you know, we'll look at look at the, the market price and see see where the wheat futures are for um for for november 21 and we'll use that as a basis um to, to get the figures in and to get the discussion and then from there on um what we've been doing with our groups is to actually try and plan and to see what we can try out in the year that that may work that may may not work uh, and i think yen has been a a, a great uh, a, a great um, program for us to actually try out some of these things and mm. um, to see if we know we're on the right track or not so it's not all about yield um you know, it's trying these things out on the farm scenario to see whether they work and do they reduce your costs as, as their mileage and looking down that route would be my thoughts on it. Um, Mark, David? Yeah, similar, I would have said, Chris, when it comes to uh, going back to the original question about budgeting, you, you do look at last year and, and you like this and you look at the trends like you put up, Mark, and say, well, we know that fuel 
is at a low point, so it may well increase. Um, seeds, we know, you know, coming through, it is going to be more expensive. And, and I think actually there's one thing at the start that would, would have been interesting is like labour, because I can't see it. It, it never go, it, it probably never goes down. You know, labour costs just simply rise and rise and rise. Now, that's on an individual basis as opposed to a hectare basis, I suppose, because it might come down on a hectare basis, but the cost of labour does not come down. And I think mm -hmm. that's one that's maybe coming around. We're starting to get to the point probably on most arable units that you, you struggle to trim labour out of it without adding mm -hmm. a big shiny bit of kit that's blinking expensive. And and, and labour is getting more hard to find as you get, you know, so I suspect that cost may creep actually on us. Yeah, I, I think that, that's definitely right. It's one of the things when you compare the world over, we are probably very intensive um, on you know, a low output crop, if you like, compared to the veg world or, you know, the rest of it, we are probably putting too much effort into it. And maybe the, the our economic trends are going to show that before the farm level does. And it's maybe something we should be looking at is to say, well, you know, are we better with two or three part timers as opposed to one or two full timers? I, you know, you just throw mm. that out there, don't you? It's, it's things will change, trends will change, what people want to do will change. Mm. One, one, one approach they take on, on Canadian farms is they, um, they employ uh, labour on an hourly basis. Um, so rather than sort of salarising them, they, they pay them a, a sort of hourly wage. So they only reuse them for when they, when they need them. Um, and they find that the, the labour they, they do use, um, because during the winter months in Canada, virtually nothing happens really. Um, so that labour can go off and, and do something else. And, and what they found is they're quite happy to do that. They're quite happy to find other work, other jobs elsewhere um, to sort of supplement their, their annual wage really. So um, that's just, just how it works in, in Canada, but uh, it, it could be something that uh, works elsewhere as well. Yep, that's absolutely. like a, having a zero hours contract in, in agriculture. That's an interesting thought, isn't it? <laughs> yes, mm. that's exactly what was going through my mind, David. <laughs> 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 uh, mm. Not sure how that's going to work. <laughs> no, I like the idea. I like the idea. Mm. <laughs> but but there are other people that have taken maybe the opposite approach to that, Mark, and have said, you know, some of the um, you know the work uh, we, we've done. Um, with with the HDB on other farms, you know, looking into uh, what what you're actually doing when you're on farm, and some people have actually turned around and said, "Well, I'll tell you what, we'll, we'll pay your salary of X, but actually, we only want you here um, when there's something to do. I don't want you just driving around the yard in the forklift or or driving things about for no reason. So if there's nothing to do, nothing moves, um, but you still get paid your salary. Um, but as long as you're here when I want you, then." you know because in our society you're better to have a regular wage than than to have this lump sum coming in in three months aren't you so it's mm. i suppose that's just in the detail but it's ultimately pointing to the same thing is that unless there's something to do don't be here um mm. which is obviously a different mindset completely isn't it i mm. think it, i think that's more likely to be the story rather than the canadian example i, I think we're more likely to keep people from full-time employment but just even it out it means you might have to pay a bit more overall, but it means that you keep the skill set when you need it. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. And, and then you can then there's always diversification and the quiet spells, I suppose. And <laughs> dare I say it, you've got to look at livestock and everything, yeah. You know? <laughs> 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 I think those words would pass your lip, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. Don't record that. No. <laughs> <laughs> Going back to forward planning then and budgeting, is, is budgeting one of those things which you just do as a one-off event or would you tend to come back to it on a regular or, 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 or more or frequent basis depending when you need to? I'll pick up on that Mark. Um, personally, uh, uh, well I do have a, a budget, it's not a set in stone budget um, because that'll depend on yield potential and various other things but I do have a budget and it's done for 2021 already um, and I will look at that and I will come back and look at it fairly frequently um, and that will guide me on grain sales and grain sale values and what the market's doing. And I put that, that yeah, it gets updated automatically because I put the grain sale figures in when I've made a sale 
and that updates the the overall uh, uh, budget every time I do it. It's a spreadsheet, but it's what I do, and, and I find that's quite helpful in focusing the mind on marketing. As Mark said uh, before, marketing is actually what we all need to be getting better at, and I find that pretty helpful in, in focusing me on trying to uh, uh, you know, keep the marketing right, knowing what's going on. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think most programs, you know, accounting packages will run budgets to actuals mm. um, as you populate them throughout the season. I think from the farm bench aspect, once you've got the budget done uh, in the winter program, you know, we do tend to have a little look at it just in the in the pre-harvest meeting to, to say, well, you know, this is a cost of production. Where do you think you are? Will that influence what you put in the ground next year? Um, mm. Just to have a think just right before the combine rolls. Um, to just review the season uh, as we know we've got to. So I think, the, you know, continually populating um, programmes, uh, you know, to give you the answers as you go is uh, is definitely worthwhile. It makes the review process that much simpler, doesn't it? So if you were talking to somebody who, who doesn't do any budgeting, any forward planning, then where would you ask, say, start? Uh, practically, where would you say, yeah, this is what I'd start with if you want to start to do budgeting or forward planning? Well, starting to me, starting with last year's figures and understanding them um, and then say, OK, now, is it going to be the same next year or is it going to be different? If it's going to be different, why is it going to be different and how is it going to be different? So I, I, to me, I, you have to start with your with, with, with history. I don't see there's a, a choice just plucking stuff out of the blue or, or I suppose, um, yeah, using a consultant if you really want to, but, but trying to get a, a handle on what has happened to then focus your mind on how you... Uh, uh, go, you know, looking forward and setting up a budget. And also following on from that, David, it's and it's not just looking at accounts because accounts are completely different from management, mm -hmm. which I've discovered budgeting the last few years. It's you need to you need to get your accountant on the board. As, well, you don't need to get your accountant on board, but it's nice to have your accounts set out in a way that makes budgeting easier because the two are different. So a set mm -hmm. of accounts for the tax man is different from a from a set of accounts for use for budgeting purposes. So you need to understand where you need to pull the figures from and where they may be hiding within the tax accounts. Um, mm -hmm. And it's trying to have that set out in a logical manner that makes the budgeting process easier. Yes. Um, and that's an ongoing for me. It's it's not, uh, I'm not trying to say, I'm not as neat as organised as David. Um, <laughs> uh, and mine's, I haven't even started budgeting yet. I'm still trying to finish this year. So um, it, it's a nice wish to get to. But you've got to start somewhere and then it's getting that getting your own accounts and in, in a way that you can read them or pull mm. out the information required absolutely and i think for for us you know seeing these guys in the groups uh, you know the power in the group as well to to have the conversation with others and you know you learn so much from 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 a you know a one minute conversation with somebody about how they do things which can sometimes make it easier for you to pick up tips and and tricks that can, that can make the job um, go that much easier. So I think from within the group, there's there's a wealth of knowledge uh, in there that, that that can help you um, move forward very rapidly. So uh, I think you know don't don't take it all on yourself and and, and try and be part of a, a group of like-minded people that that have similar goals. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, is there anything else you'd want to sort of mention around sort of forward planning, which might be useful for anybody listening to this uh, in terms of sort of tips um, or any advice? Uh, I'll chuck one in here uh, and it's very, very difficult to do, but not be greedy. If you know you've got a profit, get some sales done. Yeah, I would agree with that, David. You know, don't chase the don't chase the dream, uh, the dream. No, no. No, that, I think that's absolutely right. The marketing strategy has to be key. If you know you're in profit, you should be selling. You know, don't don't mm -hmm. wait for the um, for for the highs of the market. It's 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 unachievable. You know, at best, it's um, yeah, with, without a doubt. Well, it's a gamble, isn't it? And you, the whole thing about this is risk management and holding everything off and trying to sell it at the top of the market is a huge gamble. Yeah, 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 exactly. Sure. Are there any sort of rules of thumb in terms of you know how much your grain you might sell forward, how much how much you might sell, you know, uh, off the off the back of the combine? I mean, what is there any sort of rules of thumb on how much you sort of try and sort of you know sell that uh, sell that grain to try and maximise the sort of prices over the season? 
for me, um, I, I would, I mean, all of my malting barley is on contract. Uh, so that's 100% sold forward. Um, I would try and do probably somewhere around about half of my wheat acreage. Um, and um, probably somewhere between a third and a half of my oilseed rape. Um, just just to try and get a, a, a well, to me, a line in the sand where you like not to sell below, you know it's in profit, uh, and then work away from there. Yeah, I think you're right, David. You know, if you see, uh, it's going back to if you see a price and you go to yourself, well, if this is the worst price I get, would, would, would I be happy? Mm. Uh, and, you know, most of the time, the worst price you get sometimes turns into the best price you get mm -hmm. <laughs> more often than not. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think there is a hard and set rule because because if you look forward onto the market and it's and it's it, it, it's in profit you should be selling. Mm -hmm. but you you don't then just want to sell willy nilly into a part and then into market that you've got to understand where the market is and why it is what it is. Mm -hmm. So it might be at a high point because of supply and demand, but it might be at a high point because of some other reason, nothing to do with the supply and demand of the product. So okay. you've got to have a wee bit of knowledge of the market as well to make the decision. Mm -hmm. It's uh, Unfortunately, there's no easy rules. Mm -hmm. But it goes absolutely. back to knowing what your cost of production is, I suppose. Mm. Yep, absolutely. Perfect. No, well, we'll just round up. Thank you very much uh, to Mark and David for joining us, and thanks very much to uh, Mark for that for that insight into the cost of reductions and just a, a few things uh, there that's coming out of the farm bench data. So, um, I think we'll we'll look forward to to seeing the rest of the the, the grain outlook uh, week and how it goes. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Cheers. Yeah, cheers. Right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.